Welcome to kickoff weekend for Polar Dino Fest, a 10 week exploration into the world of polar dinosaurs. My name is Randy Yermas. I'm the chief curator and curator of paleontology at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And I'm joining uh, you all right here from the paleontology collections. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone to, that to kick off Polar Dino Fest, we have a total of six live stream panels happening this weekend with 12 guest paleontologists from all around the world. These live streams are today and tomorrow at 11 a.m., 2 p.m., and 5 p.m. Mountain Time. The live conversations kick off 10 weeks of polar dinosaur exploration, and we'll be releasing one new video from each of our guest paleontologists each Friday uh, at 10 a.m. between now and April 2nd. Uh, you can see the complete schedule of our live conversations and the video release dates and learn more about our speakers at nhmu.utah.edu slash DinoFest. And um, as we get started, we encourage everyone to submit their questions uh, to this live stream via our website, Facebook, and or YouTube. So without further ado, let's get started and let's meet our expert panel. Uh, we're joined virtually by paleontologists around the globe. Um, so first, let me introduce Dr. Anne-Laure Decombex from the National Center of Scientific Hi. Research in Montpellier, France. Welcome, Anne-Laure. Hi. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Nate Smith, Associate Curator at the Dinosaur Institute at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. How's it going, Nate? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to Dino Fest. And we also have Dr. Marina Suarez, Associate Professor of Geology at the University of Kansas. How's it going, Marina? Hello, happy to be here. All right, well, all three of our experts today uh, are do research in the polar regions, whether it be the Arctic or the Antarctic, and uh, not just on dinosaur paleontology, but the habitats and ecosystems surrounding that. So before we get into questions, um, I just wanted to ask if a few things to get a sense of what people work on. So uh, we'll start with you, Anne Laura. You're a paleobotanist, what does that mean? It means that I'm studying fossil plants, so maybe some things that the dinosaurs were eating at some point. Uh, so yes, I'm trying to describe those plants, reconstruct the environments, and you know, understand what type of vegetation we had in the polar regions. Great. And how did you get involved in working in Antarctica? Uh, I did a postdoc at the University of Kansas after my PhD. And there's a group there working on plant fossils from Antarctica. This is how it started. And it's still going on now. Awesome, fantastic. Can't wait to hear more about that. And Marina, you specialize in sort of habitats and paleo environments and some, uh, something called geochemistry. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure, yeah. So um, I've always been interested in fossils. But one of the things that um, kind of piqued my interest when I started my PhD at, at the University of Kansas as well um, was uh, utilizing um, chemistry to kind of uh, explore and answer different questions from either rocks that dinosaurs are in or actually like the dinosaurs themselves, like using the actual bone material. And from that, we can we can uh, determine a whole host of like big picture questions, like what the climate was like, uh, maybe what things ate and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's kind of how I got involved in uh, studying geochemistry and, and fossils. Cool, and do you work at the, near the North Pole or the South Pole or both? Uh, primarily most any, any of the, I work kind of in many different locations, but one mm -hmm. of the locations where I've um, analyzed materials is from um, Alaska and other polar regions in, in, the, in the Northern hemisphere. Very cool. So we have both poles represented, excellent. And uh, finally, we have Nate Smith, who's a, a vertebrate paleontologist and uh, works with dinosaurs among other organisms. And Nate, I know you've been working in Antarctica for quite a long time. How did that get started? Yeah, it, it seems like a long time now. I mean, it started uh, when I was an undergrad in the, the late 90s. So both Randy and I are uh, sons of the suburbs of Chicago. And I went to a, a tiny little school called Augustana College out there where there just happened, I didn't plan it that way, there happened to be a paleontologist, Bill Hammer, that did research in Antarctica um, and worked on a lot of these Mesozoic faunas. And 
that got me tied into both paleontology and Antarctica. And, you know, I've, I've been in it ever since. Awesome. Well, now we have a, a brief uh, sort of sense of what everybody works on. Let's uh, get into some of the questions. Um, and we've got all sorts of, all sorts of different questions here. Um, I'm going to start out with one uh, that's sort of a two-parter. So I'll, I'll um, give one part to one of you and one to another. Um, but uh, Nate, um, one of the questions we got was, um, was it cold during Cryolophosaurus's time? Yeah, that's a great question. So what was the paleoclimate like during um, the time when these dinosaurs are, are running around Antarctica, which Cryolophosaurus is from the early Jurassic, uh, you know, around 190 million years ago or so. And I'm not the, the most qualified to talk about what the climate or vegetation was like, but I can say it, it was very different than the Antarctica we know today, right? It was much warmer, probably a, a warm temperate climate, lush with vegetation. Um, the one thing that's kind of interesting is that even though these climates would have been very different than modern Antarctica, um, for a lot of this time, especially in the Mesozoic, that part of Antarctica was still within the polar circle. So these are plants and animals that would have experienced, you know, months of sunlight in the summer and months of perpetual darkness in the winter, which is really cool to think about. So as, as Nate alluded to, uh, and Lord, can the plants tell us anything about whether it was fairly warm or cold or somewhere in between? Uh, yes, it was much warmer than today, that's sure. Uh, there was a lot of different plants in the Jurassic, um, mostly a lot of conifers in Antarctica, we find. And there has been few studies on tree rings uh, from these plants. And yes, they tend to indicate that the climate was not really warm, but let's say cool temperate, maybe. Great. And Marina, do we see something similar during the age of dinosaurs at the North Pole as well? Is it fairly warm? Yeah, most of my research focuses on the Cretaceous period, so a little bit younger than Jurassic. But um, for m the majority of the Mesozoic, we're pretty confident that um, based on the kinds of fossils and then the kind of geochemistry that we um, investigate in the rocks, um, that both polar regions in the North Pole and the South Pole were, were much warmer than today. So, you know, today, if you think about Antarctica, you know, you're thinking vast expanses of ice and, you know, penguins, whereas in the Cretaceous and probably the Jurassic, and my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, probably had, you know, lush forests. Um, and, you know, whereas today we consider Antarctica like a, a polar desert. Um, with very little precipitation. So the climate system was fundamentally different during the Mesozoic than it is today. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's very interesting to, to kind of uh, see and, and uh, try to piece together um, a, a picture of a planet that was um, much different than it is today. So people think a lot about, you know, dinosaur digs and things like that, but um, we have a real diversity of types of field work that people do here. So uh, Marina, when you go um, out in the field, um, what's it like to collect your samples? What are you doing? And is it really hard to do up in the Arctic? Um, for, for me in the Arctic, I have, I have actually not had a chance to collect samples in the Arctic. Most of the samples that I've worked on have already been collected and then I get to grab them and then, and then use a little Dremel tool and, <laughs> And, and drill some powder and then do the lab magic uh, in the lab. So, so for, for anybody out there who's like, I don't wanna camp in a tent, although I will say it's lots of fun, um, you can still be a paleontologist or a geochemist or paleoclimatologist and, and work in the lab. Um, but um, I, I actually just got back from doing some field work in West Texas actually. Um, and, and there's kind of two main parts to my research one is called chemostratigraphy, in which we collect rocks every few centimeters um, over a, a really thick expanse of rock. And then um, we'll take those back in the lab and use the geochemistry to try to help us uh, improve our age of the age constraint of the rock. The other part is to is is to specifically target certain types of rocks. So one type of rock is a carbonate rock. So rocks that are made out of 
carbon and oxygen. Um, and that's because we can use those carbonate rocks as a, as a tool to understand what the temperature or the plant life was like. And so we will scour around looking at rocks that look like uh, what are ancient soil horizons, find these little carbonate nodules. And when we find these happy little carbonate nodules, we'll, we'll bag them and then take them back to the lab and then cut them to make a uh, little slides and look at them under the microscope and then maybe do some drilling and analyze them on the mass spec. And, and when you say collecting samples, whether it's yourself or your colleagues, um, are, are we talking about like giant, you know, 100 pound rocks or, you know, <laughs> tiny little things or something in between? Usually about baseball size. That's, okay. that's what I usually aim for. Um, but when you're collecting, say, you know, 100 meters at every 25 centimeters, that starts to become a lot of rocks um, and they can become pretty heavy. So um, my, my favorite means of, of trekking out rocks is one, having fellow students and, that are younger and have stronger backs than me uh, to help, help carry them out. And then we'll usually I put them in buckets <laughs> and then we'll take them back to the lab and, and, uh, and then sort through those. Well, Nate, in contrast, you do collect big dinosaurs, well, dinosaurs of all sizes uh, in Antarctica. And so what's that like? Uh, do they all come out in baseball size pieces or is it a little different? Uh, some, some do, yeah. Uh, one of the places where Randy and I work together at Ghost Ranch in the Southwest is in the late Triassic. And, and I like working there because our dinosaurs are much smaller and easier to collect. But um, the specimens that we get from Mount Kirkpatrick in the Hansen Formation, um, those dinosaurs are from the early Jurassic. They're a little bit larger and the rock there is really hard too. So um, historically, like our approach there has been to kind of quarry out large blocks. And so we'll bring rock saws and big jackhammers and drills and kind of drill holes, um, kind of trying to make a little square rectangular shape. And then we'll sink some feathers and wedges in there and try and split off big chunks of rock that have the fossils within them that then we can ship back and prepare in kind of a controlled environment in the lab. And for anybody watching out there, if you haven't been to the Naturalist Museum of Utah to see the new Antarctic dinosaurs exhibit, we've got kind of a reconstruction of that process so you can see what it's like to actually work with those tools and collect from the mountainside. And then do you just roll them down the mountainside to the camp or how do you get them back to the lab? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the fun part too, yeah, is that we don't, we don't have a, an army of strong-backed undergraduate students to kind of haul them down, you know, and uh, the, the penguins don't like being, you know, leashed up to a cart to pull them around. So from, from that mountainside, we actually have to put them in a big cargo net and have a, a helicopter come up um, and kind of sling load them down. And that can be a little tricky too, because it's, it's a high altitude, um, you know, tricky environment. And then also you kind of, you kind of have to guesstimate the weight just right because the, the pilots don't like the, the fossils to be too light and swing around, but they also don't like them to be too heavy where they can't generate enough lift. So I know that plant fossils can range anywhere from microscopic pollen and spores to entire tree trunks. So how do you get those out of the field? <laughs> um, I mostly work on macro remains, so no pollen. Uh, it does go from baseball size to much <laughs> larger pieces and I'm especially interested by fossil trees so you can imagine I'm very happy when we find a big fossil trunk but then it's very tricky to bring back. Um, usually we just take some small samples uh, and when we're lucky enough to have for example a helicopter or something that carry big pieces we try to take big samples uh, of the trees, for example. Um, one funny thing is we're trying to piece back to together plants because usually we find the different parts in different places. We find the leaves somewhere and pieces of trunks and we are trying to find what goes with what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also a funny part of the field work, trying to collect all the plants and all the pieces of the different plants. So it's really rare to find then the, the leaves attached to the branches. Is that, is that what Yes, it's, it's really rare because if you think, for example, about the life of a tree, you have just one tree, it's going to produce a lot of leaves and, you know, seeds and 
they're going to fall and they can be preserved in the fossil record, but usually they're not attached to the rest of the tree. So yeah, it's a funny puzzle. Have you ever found them attached or been able to, to make that connection somehow? So we do find sometimes a leaf attached to a branch or, you know, a seed that is attached to something with the leaf. And this gives us some indication. And we also use some similarities in the anatomy when we have the anatomy preserved to try to find what goes with what. But it can literally take hundreds of years in paleobotany to reconstruct a fossil tree entirely. This is the great part about paleontology and geology, but also the very frustrating part is that it's a detective case where you don't have all the evidence. So. Yeah. <laughs> if I could jump and it's in. It's the same for skeletons of dinosaurs, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, so true. Go ahead, Marie. Yeah, if I can jump in really quick. An another way we get samples, um, uh, and, and this is the, the way that I've analyzed samples from the Arctic has been, uh, through uh, drill cores. So um, like the United States Geological Survey and like oil companies and things like that have have drilled cores down into the rock and then pull up those cores and then cut them in half. And so scientists can go to um, what we call core repositories and look at the rocks. And so some of the samples that I've analyzed, for example, to determine temperature in, um, in the Cretaceous of Alaska have come from those cores. So there's a lot of different ways we we can we can get samples, not just going and collecting them in person, but also collecting them from a lab. Um, that that's good to point out because I just got a question um, that is well, they asked uh, specifically to you, Maria, but also for everyone is once you once you collect all these rock samples or plant fossils or dinosaur fossils, where do you store all of them? Do that uh, you know? Don't they take up a lot of space? <laughs> Yes, they take up a lot of space, and um, I think uh, uh, you know if if all of my colleagues here, I'm sure, have moved from place to place, and you've had people help you move things and ask like, "Why? Well, what do you have in here? Rocks?" And it's like, "Well, actually, yes, we do have rocks in there." Um, so I recently started my position at the University of Kansas, so I actually had to like have a big moving truck come and collect all of my. Uh, sample material from my previous institution and move them to Kansas. And uh, normally we store them in rock cabinets and we have uh, like large spaces where we have drawers that we can put all our, our, our samples in. Um, but when we take the sample and then do all sorts of things to them, um, not only do we have like the drawers that have the rock samples, but we might also have little Ziploc bags that have the powders little slides that, um, from, from a thin cut of the rock and, and things like that. So it builds up and uh, yeah, trying to store and catalog and keep track of all these samples is, is actually can be a pretty big job. And as far as I'm aware, McMurdo Station doesn't have its own museum. So what happens to the fossils uh, that you guys collect? Go ahead, Nate, if you start. Yes, yeah, so those, those specimens, um, go back and uh, get cataloged and curated and put into museums, you know, just like yours, Randy, like, you know, right behind Randy, everybody can see some museum specimens that are <laughs> in storage there. And that's an, an important role of, of what we do um, as uh, scientists and nat natural historians is that we, we have to preserve and catalog and curate this stuff for future research. I mean, a fundamental tenet of science is, you know, the communication of it and also reproducibility. So I can't kind of write a paper about an Antarctic dinosaur and never let anybody see it again. It's got to be um, available for study. And yes, McMurdo doesn't have a mu museum, but the, uh, the Crary Science Lab does have some nice cabinets with a few kind of choice uh, specimens that are put out uh, on display. So if you're ever down there, um, make sure you go to Crary Science Lab um, and, and take a peek around. <laughs> And do the plant fossils go back to France for you to study or can, do they stay in Kansas and you have to go to Kansas to study them? They, they stay in Kansas and I uh, usually, not this year obviously, um, trip there to look at you know, what I want to work on and then either I take them back with me or I have them shipped but, or start preparing them there if it's too heavy. Cool. 
I just want to take this moment to remind everybody that you can continue to submit your questions via Facebook Live and YouTube or on our website, nhmu.utah.edu slash DinoFest. And give a shout out to everybody who's watching both on Facebook as well as YouTube. Um, so we have uh, quite a few different uh, dinosaur questions, of course. And um, I think, uh, let's see, the, which one? Sounds most exciting to start out with. There's so many, but um, I think one question is whether dinosaurs had any special adaptations to live in the Arctic or Antarctic. Do, um, Nate, do we know whether there's anything special about uh, the dinosaurs in Antarctica relative to, say, the ones we find here in the U.S.? Yeah, there's been a few things that have been hinted at over the years in, in polar dinosaurs more broadly, adaptations they might have for um, living in those environments, but nothing so far that really strand, stands up to intense scrutiny. Um, and we're only beginning to scratch the surface of some of the you know data we can get about the physiology of these animals, looking at kind of sections of, of their bones and histology and things like that. The, the material we have so far from the dinosaurs doesn't seem to suggest that they're kind of growing any differently from some of their cousins at lower latitudes. Although interestingly for a little bit older than the dinosaurs from the early Triassic where we have some of our mammal-like reptiles, the Dicynodonts, um, Meg Whitney and Chris Cedar published a really cool paper that just came out this year that suggested um, some of the Dicynodonts like Lystrosaurus might've been growing a little bit differently than their Lystrosaurus in places like South Africa and might have even uh, undergone some torpor kind of slowdowns in growth during those long uh, winter nights in Antarctica, which is really cool. And again, not to um, belabor the point, like just the tip of the iceberg in terms of <laughs> learning more about the biology of these polar animals. Well, and do we see any adaptations in the plants for the long polar nights? Um, did they keep their leaves <laughs> all the time? Or? also something we're trying to look at. Uh, we know from the growth rings uh, that there were a moment where the plants were stopping their growth and that's likely because it was completely dark. They could not do their photosynthesis and then they just stopped growing. But we don't really know for most of the plants if they were evergreen, they were keeping the leaves like conifers in Siberia, Siberia today, or if they were losing their leaves. Uh, we have evidence that probably both strategies existed. Um, the Glossopteris, which is one plant that was very common in the Permian in Antarctica, for a long time uh, we thought they were losing their leaves in winter because we found a lot of leaf uh, mats that seem to be the equivalent of a fall, you know, and all the leaves are preserved. But we did some uh, anatomical studies and geochemistry on the growth rings and it seems there are two different types and some of them probably kept their leaves during the polar winter. So there's a lot of questions and, you know, things to investigate. <laughs> awesome. Um, we had a question uh, for you, Maria, which is uh, that we mentioned that um, it was significantly warmer uh, during this time on average in the age of dinosaurs. So uh, Jackson from Texas wants to know why were the polar regions warmer? Oh, that's a good question. Um, pro well, we've, we, we've studied this a, a, a fair bit and we're still working on details, but at least for the Cretaceous, it probably was because there were more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than there are today. Um, and we think that probably had to do with uh, volcanic activity, but there were probably a number of feedbacks related to, to, to that, to the climate system that helped boost the, the warmth. So for example, if you have more CO2 or more methane in the atmosphere, it's, uh, you know, you get this greenhouse effect, just like we talk about today and how climate's changing today and probably made it much, much warmer. Um, and then there's various feedback. So for example, when it's warmer in the atmosphere, more, uh, more water can be stored, if you can, you can put it that way, in the atmosphere. And uh, water vapor is um, also a greenhouse gas. And so things like that, the different kinds of vegetation that you have. So today in the polar regions, right, we have um, tundra, um, and that has a different 
you know, reflectivity than say forests. And so if you have a, a darker color forest where you have like green leaves as opposed to, you know, snow on the ground or grass on the ground, um, that can absorb more heat and help kind of reemphasize that warmth. So there's a number of reasons why the climate was probably warmer in the Cretaceous. And, and this, these are all the little intricacies that paleoclimatologists uh, try to study, like how much exactly CO2 was in the atmosphere and how much of the warmth was generated because of that and how much was generated because of these uh, little feedbacks and intricacies in the climate system. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how much the earth has changed through time. Uh, and, you know, it's, we're so used to thinking about our modern world, but this really was truly a different, truly a different world. Um, and Laura, you mentioned that um, things like conifers, so relatives of pines and spruces, and maybe, I don't know if you mentioned things like ferns and stuff like that, but uh, one of our questions uh, was uh, from Navina in Riverton, who was wondering, have you found any prehistoric flowers in Antarctica? Uh, no, because the time periods that I study are too old to find flowers. Uh, but I, I'm sure if you're looking at Cretaceous or, you know, younger sediments in Antarctica, there's no reason you would not find flowers. Uh, because the plants that we find in the polar regions uh, under the warm climates, they're very comparable to the groups of plants we find in other places. Yeah, it's hard to think of a world without flowers, but most of the age of dinosaurs have no flowers. It's uh, another really different thing about it. Uh, so there's a, a question um, about, which I think it was just a really great question, thinking about modern animals, right? Since it was so dark for a large part of the year, even though it was warmer, um, Nate, do we have any evidence that these dinosaurs or other animals migrated? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And, and unfortunately, we, we don't. I mean, migration is one of those kind of um, behavioral things that can be really tricky to get at in the fossil record. I think there's been some studies done with um, Arctic polar dinosaurs trying to look at their bone histology um, and or oxygen isotopes to see if they can kind of detect, you know, these animals kind of um, incorporating uh, elements into their bones from kind of different regions or different climates. And that's, that's kind of scraped at that question a little bit, but we don't, we don't have any solid data on that for um, Antarctica and some of our Mesozoic faunas. Although it has been, um, Jim Collinson had a paper where he postulated once that um, whether or not it was a migratory thing or maybe just kind of a, a larger scale dispersal thing, which accounts for some of these animals in Antarctica, that there might have been uh, a, a geographic, a physiographic corridor between um, places like the Karoo Basin and um, Central Trans Antarctic's back during the early Triassic. And um, there's a question here I want to make sure I get to, uh, and um, I want to ask it of everybody, um, and we can start out with, with Nate um, and go around, which is, um, how do you, you know, what do you have to do to become a paleontologist or paleobotanist or geochemist? So um, how does one, this is a question from Bodhi, how, how does one become a paleontologist, um, especially if you're, you know, a school kid right now? I love answering this question and, and my most honest answer is um, for me by accident, right? <laughs> I, I started off uh, undergraduate planning on being a chemistry major and got more into evolutionary biology and anatomy and then like I said, I had the, the luck to be at a place with a paleontologist that I started working for um, and got me into paleontology and, um, and uh, Antarctic science. But the reality is that um, in the US, I would say there's a lot that pass to paleontology academically, kind of go through biology and geology programs mostly. But the reality is that it's such an interdisciplinary and integrative science that there is a path for just about any interest you have into paleontology, whether you like being outside and playing in the dirt or like spending time in front of the computer crunching numbers, if you like working with 3D models, if you like working with, you know, skulls and bones and, and flesh and tendons and things like that, if you like working with the rocks and environments or the chemistry, you know, there's, there's going to be a place for you in paleontology. Uh, Anne-Laure, what was your pathway to uh, paleobotany? 
Uh, I started by uh, doing an undergraduate in general biology. Uh, I was mostly interested by animals at the time. And then I started to study botany and I found that, oh, plants are really interesting. And one of the first research projects that I did was on fossil plants and that opened like a new world. I realized, okay, plants are cool, but you know, fossil plants are even better. There are so many questions. <laughs> and then, you know, I did my second year of master's and my PhD um, in paleontology. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many more plant fossils than dinosaur fossils. You have a lot more data. <laughs> That's also a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Marina, how did you get into geochemistry and, and sort of studying paleoenvironment with dinosaurs? Um, yeah, so when I was pretty young, I, I decided I wanted to be a paleontologist. So maybe second grade, I suppose. <laughs> um, and you know, I started collecting rocks when I was probably about six or so, and um, and so all the way up through my undergraduate, so so one one thing that I would say for all you kids out there is, you know, you need to, you know, be, you know, do your homework and and stay in school and 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 try to get into college for whatever you're interested in. Um, so when I was an undergraduate in college, um, I um, I decided to major in geology because I I kind of felt like I liked the rocks a little bit more than I liked the bones. And as I progressed through um, my undergraduate and then graduate school, I got uh, very um, intrigued by the, the different kind of questions that could be answered by using geochemistry. And up until that point, I had always kind of been a little bit averse to chemistry. I, it was <laughs> probably my worst subject when I was a high school student and I had to get a tutor to help me with chemistry because I felt like it wasn't very intuitive. But once I had something that I was really interested in applying chemistry to, um, it became a little easier. And once I was able to like get my own data and then try to interpret that data, um, that's what kind of helped me um, uh, kind of bridge the gap between paleontology and geochemistry. And, and, and lo and behold, now I'm the director of our stable isotope lab. So, um, so I, I would tell people to keep an open mind uh, in terms of, of what, what you'll end up doing if you want to go into the paleo route, because like Nate said, there's a whole different, uh, a whole host of interdisciplinary um, topics to study. Uh, in, in paleontology, even art, for example, um, there's a, a, a whole, um, you know, kind of uh, industry of paleo artists that have to learn about, you know, I get questions from paleo artists like, well, what kind of plants or what kind of environment would it have looked like when they want to draw or paint or sculpt, um, uh, you know, images of these landscapes and animals that are so interesting to all of us. Yeah, I think that's right. Embrace serendipity and the opportunities that come up. It, I think all of our careers that there's been a lot of that. So, uh, very good. And from paleoclimatology, I actually have a, a there's a question here from uh, Anlen who's asking, does it um, does the current climate change in the polar regions make it harder or easier to do field work there? Um. So, since I have yet to be able to do field, although I'm, I'm, I'm working on a grant to hopefully do some field work in Alaska, but um, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm, my guess, and maybe Nate and, and uh, Anne Laurie can, can kind of speak to this, but um, I, I assume it's a, a maybe a little bit warmer, so maybe it's uh, not quite as bad <laughs> to go to the Arctic, but I mean, I feel like cold is cold, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Laura, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, ice is melting and maybe we can find more fossils, but the bad side of this is that there are changes in climate patterns. And I know that, for example, the last time I was in Antarctica, there was some very unusual uh, weather and that can be problematic for, you know, expeditions there. Uh, Nate, I don't know if you had some problems, but... Yeah, one of the big challenges is, I mean, we've got to get all those people and all that equipment down to Antarctica to work there. Um, and one of the um, big drivers of that is a C-17 Globemaster, um, one of the jets that flies down there. And it's 
uh, now it's warm, so warm during those summer months that there's a, a limited window that those can go. So now instead of flying one plane down, one big plane down, you've got to fly maybe seven flights with the, the, C, the LC-130 Hercules. And that creates this big logistics backlog and kind of a domino effect that causes a lot of problems for doing science in Antarctica. So yeah, the, and that's, it's a great point to kind of take away from this in general is that when we talk about Antarctic paleontology, we're talking about a world and an Antarctica that was very different and, and changing in the, in the past. And Antarctica is very much changing still today. Well, speaking of those challenges of field work, uh, Gretchen from Cedar Hills, Utah was, on YouTube Live was wondering, how long does it take to extract a dinosaur skeleton in Antarctica? I know like, so we see this complete skeleton of Cryolophosaurus in the Antarctic dinosaurs exhibit. How long did it get, take to get all that back to the lab? Uh, well, longer than um, the age of some of your viewers probably because that, that site was discovered in 1990 Right? And it's been worked over several field seasons. So unlike a lot of places in the, you know, the Southwest US, we can't kind of go back to that mountainside every year. Um, we only have those kind of big camps, you know, at, at best maybe every five or seven years and they're not always in the same place. Um, so there's been a handful of seasons excavating there. Uh, and then it also takes years and years of preparation in the lab. Um, that's often, as Randy knows, um, one of the kind of uh, links in the chain that takes the longest time. Uh, and, you know, we sometimes estimate that maybe every hour that I spend in the field kind of excavating some fossils, there's going to be about four or 500 hours in the lab, you know, preparing them, conserving them, curating them, putting them back together and getting them ready for study. Um, so it's, it's a big, big time sink. Hopefully it's paid off though, if you've seen the exhibit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> most definitely. And for those of you who are uh, here in Utah or nearby, I encourage you to come check out Antarctic Dinosaurs in person at the Natural History Museum of Utah. It's open through April 4th. Um, and you can get your tickets in advance online. Um, so connecting dinosaurs to the other parts of their ecosystem and these links between what they eat and who eats them, um, given these conditions that we talked about that it wasn't you know, as cold as it is today, but it was definitely dark during the winter and some of these plants may or may not have lost their leaves. Uh, and Laura, there's a question from Joe and her students in Northern Arizona, whether di polar dinosaurs would have had a hard time finding plant food in winter. Probably. Probably, yeah, so it's been uh, a difficult time. Yes, uh, I, as I told you, we, we don't know the leaf habit of all the different plants, but but I, I would say that probably in winter, it was more difficult for herbivorous uh, animals to find food. Yes, definitely. But they could move, unlike the plants, so. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, there's some other um, sort of more general questions. And um, one of the sort of biggest ones, which is, take a long time, but maybe if we get a brief overview from Nate is just what sorts of dinosaurs are found in Antarctica? What types? Um, so yeah, from our early Jurassic site, we only know a handful right now. We have uh, meeting dinosaurs, the theropods in the form of Cryolophosaurus. Uh, we also have um, long-necked plant-eating dinosaurs, the sauropodomorphs. Uh, we have Glacialosaurus, which is not known from nearly as, as complete a skeleton. And then we have um, a couple of partial and near complete skeletons of some new species of long neck dinosaur. Right now we're missing some of the other groups of dinosaurs that would have been around during that time, including you know, the Ornithischians. But the important thing to keep in mind, in mind about that area is that that's just pretty much just one site on one mountainside from the early Jurassic of Antarctica. And that's the only window we have right now. So we can kind of speculate about, you know, oh, we're missing this, these dinosaurs weren't there, but we don't really know for sure they weren't around because we haven't gotten the chance to sample um, all those environments and all those regions yet. Yeah, there's so much more to discover. It's, it's really incredible. And hopefully uh, this event and all the talks you see over the next 10 weeks will inspire you to become a paleontologist or geologist that goes to the polar regions and makes those discoveries. Um, we've got a Quite a few more questions. We unfortunately won't be able to get to all of them, but following up on a, a question earlier, uh, Luke from Charleston, South Carolina asks, 
if a sample or a fossil doesn't turn out to be useful scientifically um, and worth hanging on to, what happens to it? Like, are there just piles of disappointing rocks in Luke's words outside the back of the museum? <laughs> uh, Rina, I don't, what do you do with your samples if, if you're, you don't need them anymore? Um, I usually keep them all. <laughs> yeah. like because, well, because we, particularly for paleoclimatology, um, we, we, we have new proxies or, or substitutes for determining climate that are being developed every day. And so even though I may have collected a sample and uh, maybe done some analyses on it um, and think I'm done with it, there could be a new technique that um, could be, can be applied to that sample. So, so I usually try to keep them as much, much as possible. As you can imagine, uh, you know, I'm just one person in my geology department. We have a lot of people in our department and they all collect a lot of different rocks. And so um, there, there, you know, there does, you know, you did get a little crunch for space. So um, we, we try to, you know, be mindful about space and like, you know, maybe if this sample has, we haven't utilize it and we probably won't utilize it you know we we have like a rock garden where where we, we um kind of toss old samples and and school groups sometimes will go and like collect you know do some rock collecting we can use it we can use it for teaching labs and and things like that um but i usually try to save as many of them as i can <laughs> and laura do you um do you make that evaluation with plant fossils in the field or you know do you sometimes have plant fossils you bring back to the museum and decide later uh, we don't need these well when we can actually see the plant remains on the rock we can you know choose what is interesting for us but we also sometimes collect um what we call fossil peat and it's like you know peat just fragments of plant remains that are preserved in the rock and when we collect this, we usually have no idea what's inside the rock. So we collect this type of rocks. We know there are plant remains inside, but we don't know if they're good, interesting or what. So sometimes we come back, we cut them and they don't seem interesting. But like Marina say, we don't know. Maybe in the future they will be studied you know, in other ways. Uh, we have people who are looking at fossil microorganisms and sometimes they can find those in there. So basically everything we bring back and it's complicated to bring them back. We <laughs> and, and Nate, is there a secret pile of dinosaur bone fragments <laughs> out behind the Los Angeles Museum? <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not to my knowledge, no. We, we have a lovely nature garden out there though. But this, I like this question because it, it really brings up the important point of the role that natural history collections and natural history museums play in kind of preserving um, these specimens for perpetuity and future research. And Marina makes an excellent point, which is that just because it's not interesting for you today or you can't do something with it doesn't mean it's not gonna matter a lot later on. And the story of natural history museums is replete with, with um, instances like that. If we think about, if you're familiar with Rachel Carson and, Carson and Silent Spring and the role of, of DDT in thinning raptor eggshells, well, emphasizing that or, or kind of proving that, that that correlation existed relied on a lot of museum specimens of, of eggshells in kind of pre-pesticide times, or maybe more to our geochemist point here. Um, I know that you can get thing, certain oxygen isotopes from seabird feathers. Um, and I know that there are collections kind of going back into the 18 or 1900s where these have been sampled to understand about ocean chemistry and, and temperature, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And I can promise you that the natural history collector that was kind of plucking those bird feathers back in the 19, early 1900s was not expecting a, a geochemist uh, to analyze them uh, years and years later. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's why our museums are so large and have such big collections, but it's so important to keep these specimens and take care of them for future generations. That's really one of our biggest roles as museum scientists. Um, so we are unfortunately out of time. There were so many other great questions that we did not get to, but um, just a reminder that we have our next live stream event at 2 p.m. and one at 5 p.m. So if we didn't get to your question this time, maybe you can ask those uh, either at the live stream events later today or those tomorrow. Um, so a huge round of applause and thank you
to uh, Marina and Laura and Nate for joining us uh, this morning. And uh, thank you all to all of you for tuning in and joining us for our first of six Polar Dino Fest conversations happening this weekend. Um, as I mentioned, our next live stream is at 2 p.m. Mountain Time this afternoon with paleontologist Pat Druckenmiller and Karen Clayson. And this weekend's live conversations are just the kickoff for 10 weeks of Polar Dino Fest exploration with a new uh, recorded dinosaur research video being released each Friday at 10 a.m. between now and April 2nd. And you can see more about the schedule for both the live streams and the release dates for those videos um, on our website at nhmu.utah.edu slash DinoFest. And uh, just finally, don't forget that the inspiration for our theme this year at DinoFest is uh, definitely our special exhibit, Antarctic Dinosaurs, which is open now at the Natural History Museum of Utah through April 4th. So be sure to reserve your tickets in advance online so you can experience that, that exhibit in person. Um, and finally, thank you again, and we hope to see you in just a moment at 2 p.m. Mountain Time for our next live stream. Thanks, everyone. Every year, NHMU's